Please, uh, Sergeant at Arms, please start your recordings, computer on cloud recording. PC recording has started. Backup recording is on. Thank you. Sergeant Biondo, you may begin with your opening statement. Good morning, all, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing on the committees of fire and emergency management jointly with technology. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video? Once again, all panelists, please turn on your videos. To minimize disruptions, we ask everyone to please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.myc.gov. Again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chairs, we are ready to begin. Sorry if that was loud. The notes say make sure it's audible. So I did. Uh, thanks for joining this virtual hearing for today's Committee on Fire and Emergency Management and Technology. Today, the committees will be examining the city's 911 and 311 responses during last month's tropical storm Isais. Additionally, the Committee on Technology will be hearing introduction number 1755, sponsored by my friend and colleague, Chair Holden. I want to point out all the council members who have so far joined, including Chair uh, Holden. That would be uh, Council Members Ku, Council Members Maisel, Cabrera, Council Member Valone, Brannon, Yeager. And I believe that's it. Please forgive me if I've missed anyone the council will tell me. Um, Emergency services, including those provided by the NYPD and EMS, are amongst the most critical services provided by the city. On a daily basis, New Yorkers rely on connecting to emergency dispatchers when faced with a medical emergency, a fire, or a public safety threat. These oftentimes life or death situations can be impacted by a few uh, minutes or even seconds of delay in the response. Unfortunately, on August 4th, the city was being thrashed by Tropical Storm Isais, and the hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers were without power. Calls to our 911 system went unanswered. Although the administration has conceded that there were temporary delays in answering emergency calls, there has been no public expect, uh, explanation for the cause of these delays, no clarity on the scope of these issues or impact on the public, and no assurances, most importantly, from the administration that they are working to address this issue. At this hearing today, we hope to receive a full picture of the happenings during Tropical Storm Isais and what the city is doing to ensure that never again happens in a time of crisis. I would now like to turn it over to Chair Holden, the Chair of the Committee on Technology, to give his opening statement. Thank you, Councilman Borelli, and uh, good morning. I am Councilmember Robert Holden, Chair of the Committee on Technology. Uh, I would like to welcome you all to our hearing. I am pleased to join the Committee on Fire and Emergency Management, chaired by my good friend, Council Member Joe Borelli of the Great Borough of Staten Island. Uh, today, we'll be focusing on the challenges faced by New York City's 311 and 911 systems during Tropical Storm Isaias. Uh, I will look to gain a better understanding of how these systems can be improved upon uh, upon for the future. Uh, we will also be hearing intro 1755 regarding an assessment of the 311 service request intake map. Intro uh, 1755, of which I'm the sponsor, would require the Department of In Informational Technology and Telecommunications to conduct an assessment of the interactive map accessible through the 311 website or mobile device applications that is used for the intake of 311 service requests and complaints. In order to, to determine the feasibility of improving the location accuracy of the 311 intake map, uh, the department would also require to submit a report of the results of the assessment to the council. The 311 and 911 systems of New York City are the largest in the country, fielding the highest call volume per year as well as servicing the most people. However, Tropical Storm Isaias has made it clear that our calls system still have a long way to go um, 
needed to sufficiently serve our communities when we need them most. Uh, during the storm, many New Yorkers trying to call 911 were met with an answering service and were unable to reach a live operator. Unfortunately, this was not the first time that this happened this year. The 911 system's lack of capacity to handle high call volume was also highlighted during the height of the coronavirus pandemic as the fire department of New York uh, had to put calls on hold because of the high call volume. Additionally, many New Yorkers spent hours reporting the damage wrought by Tropical Storm Isaias to 311 as 311 received thousands of calls during the height of the storm. But many have found the reporting and responsiveness capabilities of 311 to be inadequate. One family in Queens, for instance, had to wait an entire week for a fallen tree to be removed from their home and repeated calls to 311, the fire department, the parks department yielded no results. Uh, crucially, uh, this family uh, was not able to report the severity of the situation as their service requests did not have the ability to show that the tree had come through their roof. So uh, our, our 911 and 311 systems are critical to the safety and well-being of our city's residents. And it is important to make sure that these systems are always ready and up to the task. Uh, we look forward to better understanding the challenges that uh, we're facing in 311 and 911 systems during Tropical Storm Isaias, as well as understanding how the city can better serve its residents with its 311 and 911 systems. Uh, we wish to work together with the administration on this important issue. We look forward to hearing the valuable testimonies from the administration, experts, community advocates, and alike. And uh, this testimony will provide crucial insight on the problems that currently exist and will provide important groundwork for future solution, solutions. Um, uh, I'd like to also uh, thank our technology committee, Irene Bohofsky and Charles Kim and the fire and management committee staff, Joshua Kingsley, William Hagesh uh, for their hard work in preparing uh, for this hearing. I will now turn it back to my co-chair, council Mem member Borelli. Uh, th thank you, uh, the, the right honorable person from Queens. Uh, I just want to actually turn it to committee counsel Josh Kingsley to go over the procedural items that must be said uh, before we hear from the administration. Well, thanks so much, Chair Borelli. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Josh Kingsley, counsel to the Fire and Emergency Management Committee. Uh, before we begin testimony, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you're called to testify, after which you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling up panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. I will be periodically announcing who is the next panelist. The first panelist will be giving testimony from representatives of the New York City Police Department and the New York City Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications. For the NYPD, testimony will be provided by Deputy Chief Richard Napolitano. For Do It, testimony will be provided by Commissioner Jessica Tisch. Additionally, the following representatives will be available for answering questions from the Fire Department Deputy Commissioner John Paul Aguirre and from NYPD Managing Attorney of Legislative Affairs Michael Clark and for Do It, the Director of NY or Director of 311, Joe Morris Rowe. I will call on you when it's your turn to speak during the hearing. If council members would like to ask any questions of the administration or a specific panelists, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call you in that order. All hearing participants should submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. We will now call representatives of the administration to testify. Before we begin, I will administer the oath. Commissioner Tisch, Deputy Chief Napolitano, Deputy Commissioner Aguirre, Mr. Clark, and Mr. Morris Rowe, I will call on each of you individually for a response. Please raise your right hand um, and affirm the, the following uh, Oath. Uh, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? Uh, I do. I, I'll begin with Commissioner, Commissioner Tisch. I do. Uh, Deputy Commissioner Napolitano. I do. Deputy Commissioner Aguirre. I do. Mr. Clark. I do. And Mr. Morris Rowe. I do. Thank you, everyone, and you can begin when you are ready.
Good morning, Chairs Holden and Borelli, and members of the Committees on Technology and Fire and Emergency Management. My name is Jessica Tisch, and I am the Commissioner of the New York City Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications, DOIT, and the Citywide Chief Information Officer. As Commissioner of DOIT, I oversee the largest municipal IT organization in the country. In this role, I am responsible for many of the city's critical systems, chief among them 911 and 311. Additionally, at the height of the pandemic, Mayor de Blasio tasked me with overseeing and turning around 311 operations, which was both an honor and a privilege for two main reasons. Because 311 is an absolute gem, the connective tissue between New Yorkers and nearly every local government service and the centralized depot for information about city programs. And because optimizing call center operations happens to be a passion of mine, which I came to somewhat late in life in my former job as deputy commissioner at the NYPD overseeing 911 operations. The thing I miss most about that job is working with the city's police communications technicians who literally serve as a lifeline for New Yorkers in need. With that context, I wanna thank you for the opportunity to discuss the 311 call center response to ESAIS, as well as the performance from a technology perspective of the 911 system during the tropical storm. My colleagues from the NYPD will address 911 operations on the day of the storm. Let's hit the 911 system from a technology perspective first. I can say categorically that there was absolutely no outage of the 911 system during the tropical storm. The technology performed as designed with no bugs, disruptions, or errors. However, Persistent problems with the carriers continue to undermine overall service in New York City, and this is exacerbated during major weather events. In particular, I expect that some New Yorkers had difficulty connecting to the 911 system because the storm knocked out power to telecom carrier infrastructure, including cell phone towers, meaning some mobile phones lost service or had degraded or unstable service, depending on location and service provider. And in the case of home phones or landlines, we heard that certain carriers' trunks got overwhelmed as a result of volume. To be clear, these issues would have affected all of the customers' calls, not just calls to 911. The telecom carriers must harden their infrastructure. Sandy should have taught them that. It's been eight years. And I am not telling you anything today that I haven't already told the leaders of each of the major carriers themselves. Finally, as Chief Napolitano will tell you in greater detail, at the height of the storm, 911 call volume was incredibly high. And in particular, for a sustained period of time, there were more calls than there were call takers to answer them simultaneously. But the 911 system was built to handle exactly this type of situation by queuing calls. When all the call takers were busy, 911 callers got queued up and connected to the next available police communications technician in order. Now let me move on to 311. I think the best way to understand the 311 response to the storm is in the context of the changes we put in place for COVID. During COVID, the role of 311 changed in an important way. Much like 911, 311 became a lifeline of sorts for New Yorkers. The number to call when you needed to be connected to a physician, a meal, assistance with unemployment, help applying for small business loans, the list goes on and on. In essence, so much more than what you traditionally think to call 3114. So how did we bring down wait times, which had spiked to almost an hour at the end of March based on increased volumes to virtually zero by mid-April? Well, we did it by adding hundreds of additional temporary call takers, including NYPD cadets building out several new 311 call centers to accommodate the additional staff, taking a data-driven approach to optimizing call center operations and creating express lanes for certain types of calls. So when it became clear the tropical storm ESAES might be making its way to New York City, we turned to this very playbook. First, we surged our staffing to 900 call takers on the day of the storm. This was the largest number of call takers 311 has ever had in a single day. Second, during the height of the storm, 
we had 600 call takers simultaneously taking calls. The largest number of concurrent call takers ever answering the phones at 311 by a factor of five pre-COVID. Third, we ensured our telephone system had enough capacity to accommodate the simultaneous call load and transfers. Fourth, we created an express lane for callers calling about tropical storm related issues so that these callers wouldn't have to wait in queue behind people calling, for example, about property tax questions. And fifth, we added a voice recording upfront with contact information for Con Ed and PSENG so that New Yorkers calling about power outages wouldn't have to wait on the line to get connected to the electric companies. In our planning, 311 pulled out all of the stops and then some to make sure the 311 call center was as prepared as it could be to meet New Yorkers' needs. And to be clear, all of these preparations were made 36 hours in advance. In the end, the volume was enormous, driven by tree and branch related service requests, as well as calls about power outages. For context, on the first Tuesday in August last year, 311 received approximately 38,000 calls. The full day total for August 4th, 2020 was a whopping 160,000 calls and 120,000 of them had already come in by 3.30 in the afternoon when the worst of the storm began to pass. To get even more granular, 311 received approximately 45,000 calls between noon and 3.30 p.m. That's a rate of more than 12,000 calls per hour or 200 calls per minute for three and a half hours. Using wait times as an important metric, the results for August 4th were quite good. And I'd venture to say extraordinary given the volume. Callers who followed the prompts to get to the express lane for storm related calls experienced wait times that were under five minutes for the vast majority of the day, with max average wait time of seven minutes during the one hour period between 1 and 2 p.m. Importantly, storm related volume did not affect wait times for COVID related calls. New Yorkers using the standard express lane for things like food deliveries or to get connected to a primary care provider experienced de minimis wait times all day. And Spanish speaking callers who followed the Spanish prompts saw no wait times at all. Callers who did not follow any of these express lane prompts saw an average 12 minute wait time at 2 p.m., which quickly dropped off to five minutes at 4 p.m. through the rest of the day. Now let's talk about two things that didn't go according to plan on the day of the storm. First, some callers who submitted complaints about trees or branches did not get an, an initial confirmation email that their service request was made. However, these requests did make it to the Parks Department and the New Yorkers who submitted them did receive email updates on the status of their service requests. To be perfectly clear, all that was missing was the initial confirmation email, but I will be the first to say that that is unacceptable. We have already put it in a fix to the three on one system to ensure that confirmation emails for tree and branch related service requests are sent every time. Second, I understand the parks department site for reporting down trees or branches was hit with a high volume in a short amount of time. This meant that when three on one call takers use the parks website on the day of the storm to input these service requests intermittently, they received a notice that they should retry at a later time. In certain cases, 311 asked callers to call back or attempt the service request entry themselves through the website. As I'll explain in a moment, these instances did not ultimately prevent 311 and the Parks Department from taking tree or branch service requests related to the storm, either on the day of the storm or thereafter. We made the Parks Department aware that 311 call takers were experiencing this issue and the Parks Department notified us that they had a fix in place by August 2nd, 7th. Because I'm a proponent of belt and suspenders, we are also building this form into the 311 portal itself. To put the effects of this issue in perspective, I want to make sure it's clear that 311 took the majority of storm related service requests about down trees and branches on the day of the storm. 
platform, over 15,000 of them. To put this volume in context, through August 9th, which represents a four-day post-storm grace period, 311 received a total of 20,520 tree-related service requests deduped to represent unique locations. Now I'd like to take a moment to address intro 1775. It is very clear to me that the general feedback I've received from the council highlights some of the most pressing issues associated with 311. And geolocation services, which is the subject of your legislation, is certainly chief among them. I look forward to discussing this with you and continuing to work to improve the 311 system. I hope this presentation has given you a good sense of the 911 system, uh, the 911 system's performance during Tropical Storm Isaias, and what I like to call 311 2.0, a service that doesn't just respond to New Yorkers' needs, but anticipates them, that is agile and proactive and striving to be more so every day. Thank you so much. Good morning, Chair Holden and Chair Borelli and members of the council. I'm Deputy Chief Richard Napolitano, the commanding officer of the Communications Division for the New York City Police Department. I'm joined today by the managing attorney of the Legislative Affairs Unit, Michael Clark. On behalf of Police Commissioner Dermot Shea, I wish to thank the council for the opportunity to comment on this important manner. As commanding officer of the communication division at the NYPD, I oversee all of the New York City's 911 centers and dispatching operations. Our dedicated police communications technicians, commonly known as PCTs, 911 operators and police dispatchers, are thoroughly trained on how to handle each and every one of the approximately 9 million 911 calls we receive each year with efficiency, precision, and compassion. PCTs are often the unsung heroes of the law enforcement community, fielding thousands of calls a day from individuals of all walks of life who are often in the midst of the worst moments of their life. PCTs are given 13 weeks of initial training with dispatches receiving an additional seven weeks of training. PCTs also routinely receive in-service trainings. Training modules include use of the CAD system, new code expansions, understanding routes and updates on revised directives system-wide. Upon answering a call, the PCT determines the nature of the emergency and routes it to the proper dispatcher, either NYPD, fire department, or EMS, who then determines the appropriate responders for the incident and dispatches them to the scene. As tropical storm Isaias bore down on New York City, we began to make plans to ensure that our call centers were properly staffed. Our experience with the worst storm since Hurricane Sandy indicated that increasing our staffing by 33% over a typical day tour would manage an expected potential increase in call volume. On the day of the storm, I was monitoring the call volume as it progressed. At around 11.30 a.m., we noticed that 911 calls were spiking. In addition to the extra staff that we already had in place, we began taking people off of other assignments to staff the stations. Between 12.30 and 1 p.m., we received 3,247 calls. By comparison, on Tuesday, August 6, 2019, we received 673 calls between 12.30 and 1. The call volume continued to increase, peaking at 4,724 between 1.30 and 2. During this time, we doubled our typical staffing, connected training stations to the system so that we had all available workstations staffed by PCTs taking phone calls. This is significant because no amount of additional staff could have reduced call intake times since every possible call intake station, including our terminals used for training new PCTs, were activated and being used to assist New Yorkers seeking emergency assistance. All told, we received over 25,000 calls between noon and four, which is more than we received during an average 24-hour period. 
we received more than four times as many calls than we did on average during the same time period in the August in August of 2019. This was by far the highest call volume we have received since Hurricane Sandy hit New York City in 2012. While the 911 system did not fail during the storm, the high call volume did strain the system. Of the 25,000 calls we received during this period, there was a delay in our ability to answer the significantly elevated influx of calls. Call volume slowly declined after the peak, though remaining above normal through the early evening. However, the increased staffing, utilization of all available call take stations, and slowly decreasing call volume prevented delays after 4.30 p.m. The NYPD takes the solemn duty seriously to ensure a prompt and professional response to anyone and everyone contacting our emergency call center seeking assistance. We understand that every second counts in an emergency and therefore we do everything in our power to ensure that plans and protocols exist and are timely executed to address elevated call volume. This includes staying aware of potential heightened volume due to approaching weather events and staging our resources accordingly and quickly activating those resources as was done during this event. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to these critical issues, and we look forward to answering any questions you may have. Josh, is that all who's testifying? Okay, uh, I, I, I have a question just on the outset because I, I thought I heard two different things. Um, uh, Inspector Napolitano, you had said that there were some internal delays with the system when the volume started to peak. If, if what I got, by the way, your, your backgrounds are great. You guys should win awards for Zoom backgrounds today. You, you both look fantastic. Um, but the Commissioner Tish said that there were some carrier problems that led to the volume. Was the problems that we saw, in other words, the delays that the customers or complainants faced, was that a result of a carrier problem or was that a result of a staffing or volume on our side, on the city side of things? Maybe I heard wrong, but I just want to, that was the only thing that stood out to me. Josh, if you could unmute them. Sorry, um, I just got unmuted. Um, let me, let me clarify two separate issues. First, what I was referring to about the carrier problems. Um, New Yorkers across the five boroughs reported issues with their cell phones generally working and cell phone service. <clears throat> That's what I was talking about when I referenced a carrier problem. So if I was in an area where a cell phone tower lost power, my personal phone may have lost service may have had degraded service, which would affect all of my calls, okay? Um, including if I was calling 911. Separately, um, what Chief Napolitano was addressing before um, regarding queuing and wait times, that is, those are two distinct, distinct issues. Okay. Um can you just go over again how many call takers might be working from home, what equipment they have, who's providing that, uh, and what percentage of the total call center workforce is home at any given time? Sure. Are you referencing 311 or 911 or both? Both. Okay. So why don't I start with 311 and then I can turn it over to Chief Napolitano who can address, address 911. So for 311, the main call takers that we have are our CCRs. I think our um, allotted headcount is 265 of them. We are actually overstaffed now. We're above allotted headcount. We're at 271. All of those CCRs access the 311 dynamic system physically 
from within the 311 call center. So they don't work at home. When COVID hit in March and really in, in April when I took over, um, the volume was so high, people were on hold uh, with 311 for unacceptably long amounts of time because of, uh, because of the volume. And so what we did is we brought in surge staffing. And those surge staffers, some of them worked from uh, city facilities, but others were able to work at home. Now those, I would say the breakout would probably be somewhere like 600 working from home and 300, let's say, working from you know, the 311 call center or other call centers that we stood up. Um, to clarify, the systems that the call takers, the surge staffers working at home are able to access are different than the system that um, the CCRs can access in the 311 call center itself. So while the surge staffers were, were enormously helpful in terms of offloading some of the volume on the CCRs, they don't have the tools or the ability to take the full complement of 311 calls um, that the CCRs take from within the call center, which is why we created those express lanes. So if you were calling about a COVID related issue, the surge staffers had access through their portal um, to take those types of calls. And we set up the same type of thing in advance of the storm, the express lane for down trees and branches so that the surge staffers working from home would be able to take those. And now I'll let Napolitano respond to the question on 911. We have approximately 1,350 call takers and dispatches assigned to the communications division. On the day of the storm and leading up to the storm, we had numerous meetings taking a look at staffing based on past storms. And we, addition, we added an additional 33% of our call takers to the morning. That was with an account that we had a huge uh, backup, a resource pool of administrative uh, workers that are technically doing training, roll call, payroll, taping records, but because it's a Tuesday, between Monday and Friday, most of the administrative staff work, we knew we had that pool. If this storm was occurring on a weekend, I would have had to double my staffing on the weekend. So leading up to it, we had that pool ready. I came in and I spoke with all of the unit heads and I had them on standby with their headsets available. So when this storm started increasing around 11.30, we had uh, extra staffing added. Then when it hit us even harder at approximately 12 and after 12, we had all available staffing. We had training canceled. We even had 24 additional people come from home. What happened was we filled up all available call taking positions as I said in, in my testimony. And we even added the, uh, the training classroom like I mentioned and we staffed that as well. Thank you. Um, just so on, on August fourth, Bill Needhart, the press secretary to the mayor, he he had tweeted out that three one one, and I quote, had already received one hundred and ten thousand calls uh, as of three p.m. that day. The open data data set for three one one though shows there are twenty two thousand seven hundred and twenty four service requests and 18,250 call inquiries from that day. Do either of you, and I, I guess I direct this more towards Commissioner Tisch, uh, do you know how this 110,000 call number was obtained? Uh, and should that alarm us um, since there are only, you know, 40,000 or so service requests or inquiries that were made? Uh, in other words, were there 60,000 calls to 301 that went unanswered? No, thank you very much for that question um, and the opportunity to clarify. Um, there were, Bill's tweet was correct and the numbers 
that I uh, laid out in my testimony, 160,000 calls uh, for the day, uh, those are also correct. There is a difference between the number of calls that we take at 311 and the number of service requests or inquiries. So to start, not every call results in a service request or an inquiry. So for example, I said that some people called uh, that, that at the beginning of the 311 welcome message, we put up the numbers for Con Ed and PSE and G. So people calling about power related issues might not, probably didn't wait on the phone to speak to an agent. They got the number for Con Ed, PSE and G, and they moved on and, and called um, those companies. So that, that's the first thing. Second thing is, at the bottom of open data, we tried our hardest to put in place a clear disclaimer, which said um, that the numbers reflected in open data um, don't reflect the total counts for service requests and inquiries based on what we had to do to surge our staffing during COVID. So the numbers in open data reflect the numbers of service requests and inquiries taken by the CCRs who work in the 311 call center. They, they do not account for the service requests or the information informationals uh, handled by our surge staffers who are working from home. This is because in order to accommodate the surge, surge staffers, have them using what's called our portal, which is basically the 311, 311 website. So if I call 311 and I choose an express lane and I get a surge staffer working from home, that surge staffer can handle, can input my tree or branch related requests, can send it over to the parks department, just like the CPRs can. But the system, because it's done through the portal rather than the Dynamics website, the system doesn't record that that is a service request or a knowledge article handled by the 311 call center. It looks on open data like it was done through the, the website. Thank you. All right, I just wanna switch gears before I hand it over to uh, uh, Council Member Holden. 911 system wide, were people texting the 911 system? And if so, how many? during the storm. Yes. Yes, they did, council member. The the texting went up pretty significantly during the height of the storm. So we had 61 uh, text during the second platoon. Typically we have about 10 to 15. And then on the third to pl platoon it starts at 3 3 p.m. till 11, we had 36. So we had approximately 100 uh, text during this day, which is uh, approximately double of our typical text average. And w were there any issues given the, the spike in volume? Sorry, w were there any issues with the text to 911 given the volume increase? There were some there were some delays at the height of the storm from around uh, one o'clock to three o'clock. We did sustain uh, delays. And uh, just stick we had with 24, 24 delays during that time. So people that were texting were also waiting to get through. What, what is I the normal response time for texting? I'm sorry, go ahead. What is the normal response time for texting to 911? Not not response time to when a, a, you know a unit is on scene, but when someone texts, you know, grandpa's having a heart attack. What is the typical time for the person to receive a text response? The typical, re basically, response time where we respond back to them with some type of text is is almost immediate, several seconds. Um, usually, text volume is very low handling only maybe two a half hour. Like I said, at, uh, at 1.30 to two o'clock, we handled 17. That's approximately eight times greater than average. So usually it's immediate. As soon as uh, the text comes in, our text operators are available. 
Just like I said, it's not being used very frequently. So the, the text operator is just there waiting for, for a call to drop in. At this time, we, we staffed up for text as well, where we went to average agents for the half hour. We had 11. Usually we have like three or four. However, the uh, texts take longer to handle, and it does tie up our operators. So there was delays as well. Like I said, there was actually 24 delays during that time. So, so just to clarify, there are 24 delays on text. Can you just say for the record how many delays on calls there were for 911? Yes, during during the 24-hour period, we had 7,177 delays. And a delay is any call that takes over 30 seconds to have an operator uh, answer that call. And do we know what the average time uh, of the delay was? We don't have an average because the system does not uh, do the average, but we have um, the longest held. And unfortunately, the longest held call for voice was a, a slightly over three and a half minutes. Okay. And do you know what kind of case that was for the three and a half minutes? No, the, the system doesn't uh, explain which call it was. It just gives a half hour breakdown. Okay. Um, in, in, in your experience, did any of the people of the 24 or so you mentioned that were delayed from texting, did they not get an immediate text and then call? Were, any, were people doing that? Yes, yeah, some of the texts, they did wait. They waited several minutes for a response. Most of the, the text that day was for trees down, wires down. They did receive a response. However, it was delayed, uh, very similar to the voice calls. Yeah. Um, so just, I, I want to go back to that. We, we know the longest was three and a half minutes. Um, the shortest delayed was 30 seconds because that's even where we start counting delayed. So I, I find it troubling that we can't get an average because I think there's a big difference between 30 seconds and three and a half minutes. I think that's, that, that, that is life or death. That, that's not 15, 20 seconds. That's, that's life or death in a, in a real life situation, especially when, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, this is even before a dispatcher identifies the nature of the call. You know, if, if it's a 911 call about a downed tree, yeah, three and a half minutes it might not be a problem. But if it's three and a half minutes while grandpa's having a heart attack, that would certainly have a problem. Um, when we implement next gen 911, do we anticipate the same type of problems? In other words, are we going to build this fancy system for next gen 911? and then still be uh, limited by the number of staff that could handle a volume of calls at any given time? We still would have similar problems as we did on the, the day of storm Miss IAS. The problem is the, uh, the huge spike in, in call volume makes it difficult to handle from a, a number of positions available as well as a, a number of operators that are available. And I'll just expand upon that. This was the highest call volume. I know I already said this in my testimony since Hurricane Sandy. On Hurricane Sandy, we went over 10 times the average call volume. We have two call centers that were fully staffed and, and manned. For Hurricane Sandy, we would have needed 10 call centers and we would have needed 10 times the amount of personnel. It's very difficult to, to, to keep up with that. For Hurricane, if, for Tropical Storm Isaias, we would have needed five call centers as well as five times the amount of staffing. And what I believe is needed, if, if in my opinion, what we need is um, we need to educate the public to not dial 911 unless it's a life-threatening emergency. Many of these calls were trees down, Unfortunately, that, that does make somebody's day. Uh, that is an emergency to most people when a tree falls on their car, clips their car, or lands on their fence. However, in a, in a storm like this, when there's thousands and thousands of trees down, they shouldn't be dialing 911. If we could teach the public to dial 311, and 311 will route it to the correct agency, and the correct agency will respond and, and, and eventually take care of the trees, I believe that's what's really needed because these type of storms are, are so 
huge in, in um, size that we can't build enough call centers uh, to handle this type of volume. So I, I definitely agree with you that we should be pressuring the public to dial 311, but let's let's stay with that though on the city's end. How, how quick can a 911 dispatcher offload a case of down tree to 311 via an operator or a digital lead? We did do that. And there was a lot of uh, coordination between myself and, and Commissioner Tish and, and Do It and 311. And we did do that as, as quickly as possible on the day of the storm. It's, um, if I just had to, uh, maybe about 30, 35 seconds, we have to obtain the information, know that the emergency is strictly just a down tree and that nobody's in danger. Once we obtain those facts, such as asking, you know, is anybody trapped in the car? If it landed in a car, is, is anybody in danger? If it fell on wires, are the wires sparking? Are they live wires? As soon as we're able to obtain that information, we transfer it to 311. Uh, and, and my and, final question, has there sorry, ever been any, yeah, has there ever been any thought um, or, uh, you know, maybe OEM, and I, I regret they're not here to answer this, but has there ever been any thought similar to the way uh, during storms we empower uh, agency managers, you know, perhaps from DOT or, or DEP or something to manage some of the shelters? Has there ever been, there ever been thought to uh, train some city workers in some sort of a, rever a reserve corps of 911 or 311 dispatchers that could be deployed just in, in short bursts in another storm? That would be very, very difficult. I'll just do my best to explain why. The system is, is requires 13 weeks of training. They learn codes. Uh, we make changes quite often to the system, which requires updates and additional training every time we make some type of, whether it's code change or, or system change. So unless they're handling calls on a regular basis, their, their training, just um, just say we trained them six months ago. If they don't use that skill, they're going to get rusty. They're not going to be efficient. And also the changes would make their response or, or their handling calls uh, probably not sufficient to uh, to handle an emergency. Would, would, there be, would, would there be a value in, in retaining some re retirees? Um, that, that could perhaps more easily adapt to, to whatever changes have come across? Again, you're, you're talking about- Retirees, we have considered that. It, it gets complicated though with the, the pay. And but let me explain what we have uh, done that I believe is helpful for COVID due to the, the large number of our operators that uh, contracted it. We trained uh, over 60 of our police officers uh, that were prior police communications technicians and have since moved on to the police department and came and, and become sworn police officers. So we have those police officers as a backup pool. We have them reporting to our call center every month though, to continue handling calls. So that's the complication where they have to keep that skill sharp and they have to repeatedly. So with members of the NYPD, we're able to have them come and, and report to the call center and we schedule that every month. So with other agencies, it would be very difficult if, if not uh, impractical. Okay, I will, uh, I will turn it over to Chair uh, Holden and I'm glad, there was a, I'm glad there was a good reason why we couldn't do that because it seems like such an obvious uh, you know, solution, but as you pointed out, there certainly seems to be a real reason. Uh, Chair Holden. Thank you, Chair Borelli. Um, I have a few questions. Uh, and by the way, thank you, Commissioner and Chief, for your testimony and, and valuable information that we've uh, heard this morning. Um, I just want to talk about storm prep for a, a few minutes. Um, now, you mentioned, um, of course, we were overloaded. Um, you know, in preparation for the storm, did, did you have um, did the call takers uh, come to a, some kind of meeting, whether it's virtual or otherwise? Um, to talk about how we handle the volume, how do we uh, shift uh, during the storm, some of the calls, um, how to handle some of the calls uh, uh, 
in a quick manner. Did, did, was that meeting of all the call takers, uh, did that occur prior to uh, the storm? So I'll start by answering. Um, I'll start by answering for three on one. Um, so yes, there was a lot of pre-storm preparation um, and it really started 36 hours uh, ahead of when the storm hit, when it became very clear that it was heading um, directly for us. Um, in terms of the training of the call takers, what we do is we put out job aids, which is something that they're used to. So anytime there's a content change happens fairly frequently at, at 311, we update our content all the time. But whenever there's an important change to processing or content, we put out job aids that um, all of the call takers review prior to coming on shift. Um, so I believe the day of the storm, there was um, a job aid about how we were going to be handling the um, 301 calls about down trees and branches. There was also additional communications to all the call takers throughout the day. Um, for example, when we were preparing to handle more volume being transferred to us from 911 after I spoke with Chief Napolitano, um, that communication, that's an example of a real-time communication that would go out to all of the call takers. Okay. Um, now, did you, uh, in preparation from the storm, did you increase utilization of automated telephone messages, possibly uh, sort of robocalls or uh, short message services or social media, uh, email alerts, uh, and the city's website to disseminate the information um, and to reduce non-critical information requests because that we got a lot of that during, obviously during a storm, you get everything. Um, and some of the calls shouldn't have been uh, placed to 911 and so forth or 311. But um, going forward, could we utilize more of that uh, in the system, like preparation for the storm? Um, did we do that this time, by the way? So, um, yes, I saw a number of tweets from various administration accounts um, and social media postings um, to try to get volume off of 911 and send it over to 311. Um, there was a lot of messaging around that. Certainly, once the chief and I spoke um, at around 11.30 um, that day, and it became clear that the volume on 911 was building to the point of like developing a queue. Um, and as the chief said before, um, I believe public messaging about when to call 911 is probably the most important thing we can do um, going forward to take some of the strain off of 911 in these major weather events. Yeah, because um, I think educating the public, for instance, if a tree falls in front of my house and it's blocking the street, people have to know, is that a 911 or is it a 311? If it hits the wires, obviously it's more dangerous. Uh, electrical wires, that sounds like a 911. But we need to break it down. We need to, and it can go through the council offices also that we could educate uh, our constituents because there is that gray area. And if we could sort of cut down on the number of calls, educate people, um, and a robocall. So you get a call and you say, uh, it tells people what to do in the event of that this happens. Uh, obviously, more, most of the complaints are down trees, especially in my district or in Queens County. Um, so we need, and, and what I, you know, I got some complaints that, that the 311 operator uh, or the 911 operator didn't know what to do in that case. Or uh, we even had one, a uh, few callers saying that they stopped taking those down tree calls um, on 911. So um, educating the public, uh, putting using uh, social media, for instance, using anything we can to get the word out prior and how to prep. And I know a lot of people don't listen to it, but I think. We learn lessons from these storms over and over again. This we learned that a tropical storm can knock us out uh, a lot uh, more sometimes than a hurricane, depending on how it hits. 
uh, we learned the number of calls that uh, couldn't be placed uh, or people got recordings. I just want to get to that in a second. Um, but if preparation, if we could all be, be included in storm preparation, uh, so we can we can help with your um, obviously your your the plight of 311 and 911 during this time. I think reaching out to us might be um, the best way to go here. Thank you. Um, just to, and so maybe we can have a task force set up next time with the council member with the council involved and in, in, um, going forward to handle some of these calls, uh, Commissioner. You might, um, you know, we might be able to educate everybody uh, together. Um, now, um, let me just uh, talk about the recordings that you mentioned, Commissioner, that people got in, in some cases. Was that on, on the 911 system that somebody got a recording? Was that the, you called it um, express lane? Was, was that where the recordings came in? So two different types of recordings. For 311, when you call 311, you reach our IVR. It's our, um, it's the way we direct calls to the appropriate call taker. So press one if you're calling about coronavirus, press two if you're calling about down trees and branches. When I talk about express lanes, it's in the context of 311 and it's those. Press one for COVID related calls, press two for down trees and branches. And what we do is we have, we staff um, those express routes with hundreds of call takers depending on the volume that we're anticipating. So on the day of the storm, if you press two, I think it was actually press three, if you press three for down tree or branch related to the storm, um, there were 600 call takers waiting to take those, those types of, of calls. Um, for 911, the recording that um, your constituent is reporting, I, I believe is different. It's not express lane. So, at, when you call 911, when they're taking delays, so when the, the calls are beginning to queue, there's not a call taker to, available to take the call immediately. Um, the caller hears a recording which expresses a, to the caller that they are waiting for, they've reached 911 and they are waiting for the next available agent or police communications technician to handle the call. All right. Um, let's go. Let me go back to the uh, tree complaints that you mentioned earlier with uh, the parks department. Um, you mentioned that the problem that you had is people didn't get a confirmation um, in making that complaint. Um, what was the problem with that, and what caused that, and how are you going to change that going uh, moving forward? Sure. Um, there was two types of, of problems that I that I referenced in my testimony. The first was that um, when callers called 311 and uh, reached a surge staffer, um, that surge staffer uh, entered the um, service request through the portal and the person making the call or making the complaint didn't receive an initial email confirmation that their service request was accepted or, or taken by the 311 system. To be clear, 100% of those service requests were taken and accepted. It's just that the member of the public didn't get the confirmation email. I said in my testimony, and I'll reiterate, it's unacceptable. We found the part of the code in the 311 system where um, that error occurred and that um, has been fully addressed. The second issue that we faced um, with 311 related to the down trees and branches uh, that day was the um, Parks Department site um, that accepts service requests from either the public or surge 311 um, call takers um, became intermittently unavailable based on the very high volume in a very short amount of time. The Parks Department, we notified the Parks Department and they have already addressed 
that issue as well um, so that their site is going to um, respond um, better under the unanticipated uh, volume that we had that day. Um, what I said in my testimony is because I believe in belt and suspenders, I'm also building that down tree branches form into the portal itself so that when that's done, uh, 311 surge call takers won't have to go and put extra volume on uh, the park's website. They will be able to do it through the 311 portal itself. Okay, um, I just want to, my final question. I have some more questions, but I'll, I'll turn it back to Chair Borelli after this. Um, there are still problems associated with the location of the service requests on the mobile app. Uh, the interface is not user friendly and makes it difficult to enter the location unless the user knows the exact address. And that's a problem we face for a while. We live in an era um, where technology is advancing um, at, a, you know, at, a big, at a great rate, obviously. But so what's, what makes it so challenging to improve the location services uh, on the app? Um, it is challenging and I'll, I'll go through the reasons why it, it's so challenging, but it is definitely something I am looking forward to rolling up my sleeves and working on with you. Frankly, when we spoke, I don't know, seven months ago about this, this is something I would have hoped um, we would have addressed already. Um, with COVID, the, the work that we've done on the through and one system over the past five months has been largely keeping up with different service offerings that all of the agencies are, are putting out there. You know, 311 is the place to call for every city service. So for the past five months, we've just um, been working really hard to keep up with all of those, all of those new offerings. Um, but now that that is hopefully quieting down, um, we look forward to working with you on improving location services on the app and on the website. I don't want to bore you too much with the technical detail, but um, I'll just explain that 311 integrates with a number of um, agency systems. Um, 311 takes the request and sends it um, to whatever agency needs to respond. Each of those systems has their own geolocation service. Um, so what we really need to do, this is a bit broader than through on one, it's fixing it for through on one, but then also at the same time, upgrading all of those systems that through on one touches at all of the agencies to have the same um, geolocation service. Because when I take a, a request uh, through the app, that address needs to go into another system. So if it's parks, for example, down trees or branches, it's got to go into the park system and they need to be able to accept that address. We can talk at length about this. I'd love to give you a comprehensive briefing on it, but it is definitely something that I agree needs to be improved. It will make a dent in terms of enhancing the customer experience of through on one, which is exactly what um, we're looking to do. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, back to you, uh, Chair Borelli. Thank you. Uh, and before I turn it over to Council Member Brannon, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of Council Members Ku uh, Ulrich, and I saw Council Member Lander, who appeared to be uh, outdoors. Uh, Council Member Brannon, for questions. Thank you, Chairs. Um, I wanted to Yes, a couple of questions about the staffing levels for for nine one one and three one one. What are the what are the total um, numbers there for staffing? I'll start with three one one, and then Chief Napolitano will take the question on nine one one. For three one one, I believe we have an authorized kid, kid count of two hundred and sixty five CCRs. We Overstaffed, so we're above our allocated staffing at this very moment. We're at 271. And Chief on uh, 911. Our head count we have approximately 
1,350 911 operators. Okay. And how many calls, what's the average call per day that, that 311, that an op, if I'm an operator at 311 or an operator at 911, how many calls a day am I taking? To unmute me. Okay. Okay, the average operator can candle 10 calls a half hour. So approximately 20. So if you multiply that by six for the hours that they're actually working, approximately 120 calls during an eight-hour period, an eight-hour work period. Most, but most of these folks are working longer, uh, longer than eight hours, right? During an emergency such as this, yes, there would be a significant amount of overtime. For, For example, example, on the day of the storm, we held all of the operators from the day to uh, onto the four to twelve into the afternoon shift. And for three one one, um, okay, thank you, Chief. For three one one, um, our call takers are handling on a normal day now um, between fifty and seventy thousand calls per day. That's um, different than the number of calls we we take to three one one because many of the calls that we take can be handled by our voice recording service. And is there what 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 is the um, for, for especially for nine one one operators? Is there any um, support or or consideration given for you know mental health and breaks and that kind of stuff with with the stress that they're under? Absolutely. The breaks, they get breaks every uh, two hours at the minimum. They get several breaks throughout the day. They have a lunch break. They have um, breaks split up between the lunchtime as well at the minimum two. So just on a typical day tour, they would get a break. Um, you could say a 40 minute break before lunch. And then they would get an hour lunch as well as a, a 20 minute break. Uh, after lunch, and they would also have personals uh, where if they needed a, a bathroom break or if they had any issues. If they've handled a very difficult call, uh, we encourage them to actually uh, step away and uh, get some time to themselves. Uh, we have a quiet room in the Bronx. We also have a, um, a unit that's sole purpose is to just help them get through difficult calls and, and difficult days. Employee assistance unit. Do you think, I mean, if, if, if money was, was not, um, what was not a consideration, are you, are you comfortable with these staffing levels? Yes, I am. So you don't think we need, we don't, we don't need more. No. And what, what about for three, one, one? Um, I took over three, one, one in the middle of April when volume was, you know, through the roof. Um, so we really um, had to rely a lot on the surge, surge staffing that we had, both in terms of the NYPD cadets um, who stepped in big for us, taking three on one calls and some outside vendors that we hired to, to take the calls. Um, but the volume that we've been receiving for the past six months has not been normal at all. It's it's been much greater than you know the volume we we took, for example, a year ago. Um, so just just to reiterate, we what, what Chair Holden brought up about how some of the calls to nine one one went to were going to voicemail during during the storm. Was that just um, you know um, I guess pardon the pun? Was that just a perfect storm? I mean, what made what exactly made that happen? Can I? I want to just clarify. Um, no calls went to voicemail. Um, what happens is well, it, didn't, it didn't go to voicemail. No one answered. Well, when when there are more calls coming into the 911 system than there are call takers to take them, the calls get queued up. 
And so that's what happens at the at 911 starting around 1130 in the morning. There were more callers than there were call takers to handle um, handle those calls. So those calls get handled by an agent in the order that they come in. And that was the first time that's ever happened? No, certainly not. Um, the chief explained that we consider delays at 911 to be anything over any wait over 30 seconds. And so that's definitely not the first time that 911 has taken delays. Chief, would you like to expand on that? Sure. Any time, as, as Commissioner Tish explained, it takes over 30 seconds. It it's a delay. It's something we do our best to avoid. However, major events, not just major storms, but a major explosion, um, a very um, noticeable fire, these type of events cause an influx of 911 calls that we do not have uh, enough operators. When something like that does occur, we did what we did with the Tropical Storm SIAS as far as pulling any administrative people off of their administrative duties and have them report to the uh, coal taking floor. Um, however, this event was just, you know, a very, like I've said before, it was uh, the biggest event since Hurricane Sandy. Something like this is, is very difficult to have uh, enough operators available. Um and so but but were we seeing delays like this and we saw delays like this during hurricane sandy as well i don't remember yeah okay uh, okay can you speak because he muted him. we can hear you okay hurricane sandy the uh delays were substantially worse um we didn't actually have as many operators logged in as, as we did during Tropical Storm SIAS. Like I said, we were able to prepare and individuals were also able to report to work. In Hurricane Sandy, quite um, a large percentage of our operators weren't able to uh, report to work. Um, yeah, something, something you said earlier um, as far as folks calling 911, I mean, I certainly was raised thinking that you only call 911, you know, um, in a, in a seat, like it, in a serious, serious emergency. But over the past few years, certainly I've heard from other folks that say you should call 911 because that's why the operators are there. You're not wasting their time. If, if it's not an emergency, they'll transfer you. Um, are we in a situation where you know, we're, we're sort of changing that? that 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 messaging or i mean because i was certainly raised like you don't call 911 unless unless you know you, you, your your life is in immediate danger um but then um you, you know and 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 it was like you know you don't want to make a false call because you, you'd get in trouble if you made a false call basically this is when we were kids right but definitely over the past 20 years or so there's been messaging that well you should call 911 if you know, if you're in danger or if you're concerned about something and then the operator can then decide or determine or triage um, if that's worthy of, of a 911 call. Uh, I don't think that there's people who, I mean, this is, a, this is something that we would have to work on, but I don't think that there's anyone who calls 311 or, or thinks about calling 311 um, if there's an emergency of any kind. And unfortunately, I don't think there's many people that, um, I don't think there's many people that equate 311 with any urgency of any kind. Um, and that's part of the problem. I, think. I understand we don't want people calling 911 just because a large branch fell down, but they know that when they call 311, basically the, the, the canned response is, well, we'll check it out within 14 days. And, you know, it's basically nothing ever happens. So I think that, I think there's a perception issue there um, as far as um, those, the two services. It's possible that individuals believe that by calling 911 improperly, that their situation would be corrected quicker. Uh, that's not the case. And as you were raised, I 
would hope to educate the public to not call 911 uh, in times like this. A tree falling down in front of your house, uh, even if it fell on your car, it's, uh, it's very unfortunate. However, it's, it's not a 911 emergency. If a tree falls down on a, a one-way smaller street, that's not an emergency either. If, if a tree falls down on the Long Island Expressway, due to the, uh, the need for that highway to be open, that would be a 911 call. So this does need um, some education for the community. And um, if, if more people thought of 911 as, as you do, council member, um, we probably would have less problems in a major storm. But I mean, there's also, you correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, I know PD also is, is, is very, um, focused on data. And a lot of times they want, you know, calling 911 in order to make a case where the first thing they'll think of, like I know with some of my local precincts, <clears throat> if I get complaints about issues or concerns about issues, the first thing they'll do is take a look to see if there were any 911 calls made. And some, a lot of times there aren't, like it could be an issue that everyone on the block is aware of, uh, but for whatever reason, they haven't been calling 911. And if there are no calls logged in for that location, it's harder it, it's harder to get them to believe that there's an issue here because they're so focused on that data. So I think that's sort of that's sort of the problem because you don't you don't want people just calling 911 for anything, um, but they don't feel any urgency of calling 311. So there's sort of a gray area there. Um, and because NYPD puts such a focus on that, um, there's, it's a problem because you want people to call um, to, to make those complaints, but you also don't want them calling if it's not an emergency. So, and calling the old rotary phone at the police precinct is, you know, something for the 1950s, you know? I understand that concern, and it, it makes perfect sense for criminal matters, for, for crimes in progress, or for um, just say a drug condition, a drug deal is on the corner. It would, would make sense to call 911 and document this, and, and it would strengthen their, their case that they've tried uh, numerous times to address this. However, for non emergencies, uh, such as trees down, or a, or block, a block, block driveway, driveway you know, just to, to cover some, some other than 311. They should, they should call, call 911, uh, 311 and, and that would uh, be documented. And, and they would they also, would if also they had to go to court or they, they had a problem with their neighbor, from what, from what I understand, I understand yes, they, they, they do keep they track of that and would that show that they're trying to address the condition. So in some cases, it makes sense for crime and emergencies, 911 will be documented for non-threatening non emergencies, non-emergencies, 311 would be better. Okay, and, um, okay. Yeah, and I think, um, yeah, I, mean, I think that's part, that's part of the concern, I guess, because then, you know, we, we need the information to sort of back up what the neighbors are saying and they have to have a way that they can actually um, log this stuff and, and, you know, make it, I guess, build a case around it. And that's certainly part of the thinking there. My last question, I guess, for as far as social media and Twitter and stuff is concerned with 311, I see sometimes, and sometimes it's constituents of mine who might um, tweet at me and at 311 or at any agency, and then 311 will pick it up. But there's always an extra step. Is there a way that it's, it's always basically, okay, I see the photo of the issue that needs to be addressed by 311. It's staring right at me and here's the address. But now sort of the 311 bot or whoever's managing the social media then says, okay, but now can you call or click on this link to fill this thing out? And it's just an extra step. Like, why can't it just be that if someone is raising an issue to 311 on social media, that it's picked up and, and someone's there to enter it in instead of actually asking the, the, the resident to actually then do that work. It just seems like a, a needless extra step. Hi, council member, uh, Joe Morris Royal from 311. I'm going to field this question on behalf of uh, Commissioner Tish. So thank you for the feedback. And uh, first off, there are 311 employees who actually do field that, uh, those, those questions through Twitter. 
Um, and they actually offer a couple of options. Um, sometimes information is needed. Um, a picture is great, but there are some uh, coordinates that may be needed, such as an address or an intersection. And the way the model works is we can offer the, give the customer the link so then they can go ahead and submit it directly. Or we offer to DM the customer, uh, direct message the customer to be able to obtain that additional information, be it an address or maybe just another step in the description process. Um, but the goal is to try to make it as simple as possible for the customer. And as you noted, um, other agencies will uh, quote unquote loop 311 in so we can go through that mechanism to produce the end result, which is a service request to the agency and a documented item for the customer. Okay. Thank yeah, you. I just want to make it as easy as possible. I mean, it's, you know, most people don't even take the time, you know, they just see an issue and they go, eh, you know, whatever, right? So, but the fact that someone's willing to actually take the time um, to, to bring it to our attention, um, you know, I want to make it as easy as possible for them to actually have it addressed. And having an extra step is just another sort of obstacle um, for a resident, you know, um, I, yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, I look at most importantly, I mean, I think we don't think a lot about the 911 operators who are really our first, first responders. They're the first in line. So, um, you know, hearing that you certainly take into account their mental health is, is very, very important because I don't think enough of us think about, uh, what these folks go through and what they have to take home to their families every day, every night. Um, and, and some of the calls that they take, um, the, the stress level must be just, you know, unimaginable. So uh, I appreciate that you guys are sensitive to that. And, um, and thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I'd like to recognize council member Deutsch for questions. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Chief, for all the great work that uh, and hard work you're both doing uh, to rectify the issue with 311 and 911. Uh, my question is uh, actually when one calls 311 about a tree down, uh, who determines the time that the agency, the time frame that the agency must respond by? So I believe you're referring um to our um sla yeah um, and the slas are set by the responding agencies so if um, you know we all know that the nypd was defunded parks the parks department was defunded by more than i believe 85 million dollars dss uh, was defunded by like 1.1 billion and sanitation was defunded by more than 100 million dollars so how does the backlog affect the system and user activity where one may continuously check the status on their complaint online or they would make repeated calls uh, on the same issue uh, by calling 311? Because I have a constituent that called multiple times for like a, a tree, tree branches that were uh, laying on the street um, after the storm. And he continuously calls 301 because on the 301 system, it keeps on checking that the case was closed. And, and also, my second question is, do you have any stats of how many repeated calls there are to 301 on the same specific issue? So um, I'll take the first question now, and I'm going to use it as an opportunity to plug a new we actually recently put into the 311 system, um, which was um, an idea raised to me by Chair Holden. Um, several months ago, he told me that um, his constituents um, didn't get confirmation emails or updates about their 311 service requests uh, through email, that they only got those um, confirmations and updates if they had um, an account with 311. So about two months ago, um, we uh, implemented a change to the 311 system, whereby anyone who um, puts a service request in uh, through 311, whether by phone, the website, or the app, if they give us an email address, they receive um, both both confirmation 
emails as well as updates um, on the status of uh, their service request. Now, obviously those updates are generated by the responding agency going into the system and updating, updating the ticket, but those now are available to 100% of um, 311 customers who give us uh, an email address. And um, on your second question about repeat callers, um, I'm gonna have to try to pull that data for you and follow uh, up with you on it. Um, what I can say is in terms of general call volume or general, excuse me, general wait times at 311, they're really de minimis. I mean, we've um, added so much surge staffing, um, the idea being make 311 really responsive or the 311 call center really responsive to New Yorkers needs. So in a normal day now, if you call 311, you most likely won't wait on hold at all, which is something that we're really proud of and we've worked really hard to make um, the 311 service uh, more customer friendly. Uh, thank you. I, I don't see any other hands, so I will turn it back to uh, Council Member Holden for uh, additional questions. Thank you, Chair Borelli. Um, uh, Commissioner um, Tish, uh, we had the opportunity to review the uh, New York City 311 task order provided by Do It last year. According to the task order, there were no provisions for patches or updates to the NYC 311 app in the contract. At our, at our last hearing, or at a hearing on January 21st, 2020, you responded that you will let us know about patching provisions. However, as of this date, we have yet to receive an answer to the following questions. Are patching mechanisms addressed in the current IBM contract with New York City 311? I apologize for not following up with you on that issue, but I can say, yes, that has been corrected. Well, I, I know you were busy, so I'm not, you were busy with a, a pandemic, so I understand that. Understanding, yes, um, we have corrected all of the issues that we identified and many of which you uh, pointed out. And of course, patching and security of the 311 system are our highest priority. Great, okay. Um, I'll, I'll just give this to uh, Chief Napolitano. Um, uh, Chief, I, I, I understand that in the uh, text to 911, um, they were operate, the operators, call takers handle both. Is that true? That they handle text and, and uh, regular calls? Yes, our operators, it is a train to handle both. However, we have it split where voice operators for the day, they just handle voice calls. We have them actually logged in to handle solely voice calls. The same as text operators. Once they log in, they're logged in as text operators. However, they're trained obviously to handle both. But um, obviously certain people are faster at texting, right? I mean, um, they would, um, probably, you know, they would most likely be better if they were just doing that, if they're really fast in texting, that, that they'd be just doing that. And I think, especially during um, an, uh, an emergency, um, that that probably should be implemented. Do you do that? Chair Holden, I, <laughs> I um, as you know, I used to oversee uh, 911 call taking operations at the NYPD. I worked very closely with Chief Napolitano. And I welcome and encourage you to take a trip uh, over to the 911 call center. Um, you have never seen faster typing in your life. That's what these agents do all day, every day, whether um, it's taking uh, calls or texts, they're constantly inputting information into the 911 system and they're amazing at it. So I think everyone there is 
a much faster text or typer than most. Right. So, that, but that's a that's a talent, and I think it should you know we should exploit that. It's a, especially not put them on calls because their expertise is is obviously texting uh, much faster than uh, the average person. But um, let, Count, let me council just, member, yeah. just to expand on that, we do have individuals that are, are very talented that work more often in the the text uh, aisle. So the individuals that are very talented at that skill and, and appreciate it and enjoy it, I should say, we assign more often. Right, okay, that, that, so it makes sense. Uh, but let me just ask another question then I'll, I'll turn it back to uh, Chair Borelli. We understand next generation 911 is set to be rolled out in the next few years. Do any of you see, foresee a next generation uh, 911 running into a similar capacity issue that we, we faced uh, recently? You want to take that? Yeah, I'm trying. I awesome. Okay, I'm back. I can see I can see a similar situation happening. That's why I, I know I'm repeating myself, but we really need the public to understand uh, that these type of natural disasters, the 911 should not be um, used for trees down, wires down, and again, you'd have to go all the way back to Sandy eight years ago. But it, it was similar, where um, hopefully we were able to, you know, learn a lot from this and also teach the community not to dial 911. Otherwise, it could happen. And, and just one more little question about um, the upload of uh, 311 uh, pictures, application photos, and video. Do we have an update on that, Commissioner, uh, when we might see an expansion of that? Yes, um, we ha based on your feedback, we have added that feature for um, the vast majority of the new service request types that we've put in place. And um, based on the list that you um, gave us of the service requests that you think it would be most relevant for, the legacy service requests you think it would be most um, relevant for, we're um, planning a major 311 release that's going to include that. Uh, don't want to bore you, but just want to mention on complexity, um, which is my problem to solve, but just so you understand. Um, adding it to the 311 system is easy, right? I could basically flip a button and add pictures to every service request type. The issue falls in terms of getting it to the agencies themselves. Not all agencies use the 311 system. The NYPD does, for example, so it's really easy to get them pictures. But other agencies that don't use the 311 dynamic system, but that take uh, the data from the 311 dynamic system and uh, bring it into an in house system, those systems need to be able to accept pictures as well. It's not useful to the member of, public, of the public if 311 can get the picture. They really need the agency that's actioning the service request to get the picture too. So that's what we're rolling up our sleeves and working on right now. So we, we still have the problem of the agency cooperating and actually looking at the photos because we've had that in the past. So uh, I characterize it as a problem of them cooperating. Um, yeah. It's something that we are working with them on, and I think. I think, you know, in this day and age that everyone understands the importance and usefulness of pictures. So it's something that as the person who's overseeing 311 now, then I am uh, eager to work with other city agencies to, to roll out at your suggestion. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thanks, Chair Borelli. Uh, thank you. And I'd like to recognize Council Member Lander for questions. Thanks very much, Chair, uh, and thank you, Commissioner and Chief, for all your time uh, with us today and all these good answers. I just um, having, and, and I apologize, I missed a chunk earlier, but I, I just want to follow up on the question that uh, Chair Holden started to ask about moving forward to next gen 911. I know in the big hearing that we had on sort of you know priorities, there are a lot of them, and I understand COVID has obviously interrupted a lot of them. 
I think it's great that the text to 911 came online even amidst COVID. So props to you for getting that, that done. Would have been easy to miss that. Um, you testified in that last hearing about some of the both benefits and then you know the long-term nature of moving beyond that to next gen 911. And I, I just love a little status update. I could see that being a thing of like, there is so much work to do uh, given all the other things you've outlined in this hearing that honestly, that is just gonna wait until like the next mayoral administration or no, that's really underway in the back rooms and there's a lot going on to get there. Um, and I just wonder if you could give us uh, an update of, of where those things of where those things are. Thank you for that question. Um, you know, during uh, March, April, May, June, July, we were really uh, slammed as the IT agency. It seemed like every agency in the city wanted to bring on a new service online, and we had really important work um, to help agencies do that. Um, and um, we were, we were very busy as you, as you can imagine, but it was really important to me not to let um, the general work of the agency slip too much or frankly slip it, slip it all on, on the really important programs. Um, so as you mentioned, uh, we continued forward with our plan to release text to 911 on time in June. Um, same thing went for next gen. I had committed to the, uh, council um, on my last next gen on my last next gen update that we would be registering all of the next gen contracts by June this year and that was done. Um, we decommissioned nice one. So again, despite the huge influx of work, we didn't um, stop plowing forward on the major uh, programs that um, do it has been working on and the commitments that we've made. Certainly certain things have slipped and, and that has to happen, but the big ones are plowing forward. Sorry, there's some construction, uh, city-sponsored construction work downstairs. So I tried to mute just so you wouldn't hear that background noise, but then I didn't have the power to unmute myself. Um, I guess I heard the chief talk about the ways in which even the next gen 911 system obviously will you know, be staffed by people and so could have some of the same challenges of staffing that we saw during the storm. I guess I wonder whether it will have benefits as well. I, you know, hopefully part of the idea of you know, moving to a, an all digital system is, I, I don't know whether it means that more things can be more quickly moved and transferred. Will there be some benefits um, to having next gen 911 in terms of search capacity, you know, or response times or some of the kinds of things that people would be, you know, ordinarily associate with a big upgrade or is this really just bringing the technology into the 21st century and integrating the voice and text and, and digital platforms? As far as addressing a surge in call volume, it would not help much in a, a day such as tropical storm SIAS because again it's it's a personnel it's just having the the, the individuals sitting down being able to handle 911 calls there's uh, many benefits from next gen 911 uh, such as location um, obtaining a, a perfect location basically off the GPS of their phone that perhaps can help um, but that should save some time, together, right? Because then the, because the caller if, doesn't if we're have able to the... um, see their location immediately. We will not spend as much time uh, trying to obtain it. So in, in a way, it can possibly help a search. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate your work. appreciate this hearing. Thank you, and I see no one else has raised their hands for questions. So with that, we will dismiss uh, this panel. And I wanna thank uh, both of you and the other uh, folks out there very much for this. Um, Josh uh, has told me, our council has told me there are two people signed up uh, to testify. So Josh, will you ask them to identify themselves and sort that out? Thank you, Chair. Um... Thanks, everyone. We're now turning to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike in our typical council hearing, we will be calling on individuals one by one to testify. 
Council members who have questions for particular panelists should use the raise hand function in Zoom, and I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and you may begin delivering testimony. So as Councilmember Borelli mentioned, we have two individuals who have signed up to testify. Um, they are currently, uh, they should be unmuted. And um, if you are, there's a caller one and a caller two who have not provided us with a specific phone number. So if you could identify yourself um, and then feel free to begin discussing, uh, I guess, caller one to start. Now we only have one caller. Call, is uh, is there an individual um, who just signed off as well? Um, so it, it appears that both of those uh, individuals who signed up to testify have uh, left the, the hearing. So Chair Borelli, um, I guess we could go back to you and, and wrap things up. Um, thank you very, very much. Uh, Council Member Holden, do you have any closing remarks? No, I want to uh, I want to thank both the commissioner and the chief. Uh, by the way, the chief and I go way back uh, when he was the captain uh, XO in the precinct, our local precinct. It's nice to see him, um, and uh, you're looking well. And I want to thank you both for your testimony. And I'm looking forward to that tour, Commissioner. Uh, of the, of, I want to see how fast uh, these people can text because. Um, maybe like Superman or something, but it's, it sounds like a, it's an amazing job that they're doing that all day. But um, thank you both and, uh, and thank you Chair Borelli. I think it was a great hearing. We've learned a lot. And um, I think we have our, our preparation certainly for the next storm, which might be coming, might be down in the tropics now um, that we have to uh, prepare. And I think the idea of doing social media and uh, alerting the council offices that we can educate uh, constituents on on obviously uh, what we talked about before about what's a 311 call, what's a 911 call, and how can we help? Um, help the, obviously the system, help, help everyone do their jobs uh, better and, and uh, just focus on uh, city services. Um, there was the breakdown we mentioned, especially um, we couldn't get answers uh, to people talking about down trees. I know uh, Commissioner uh, Tish will certainly address that and it won't happen again. But I want to thank you both for your testimony and thank, thank you, Chair Borelli. Thank you everyone for participating. And with that, this will close out today's hearing.